Got it. And All right, we're, we're now live. Uh, right now, we're live with special guest Ken Gerard. Ger uh, Ken, did I pronounce that last name correct? Gerard? No, it's uh, Gearhard. Gearhard. I'm sorry about that. See, I, I, every time, every so often, I have uh, when we have a guest, I always miss uh, miss pronounce their name. <laughs> like no, a lot of people do. A lot of people do it with my name. So. Sure. Sure. <laughs> what is your name? <laughs> it's actually uh, the French pronounci uh, pronunciation of it is Benoit. Or ah, Benoit. That, yeah. That's what I was thinking. You know, we live right next to uh, Louisiana. Is my neighbor down here? So. Ah, uh, okay, very good. So, uh, <laughs> Benoit is a name that I might encounter in my neck of the woods. Awesome. Yes. Yeah. Because a lot of you know, a lot of the French side of my family is from Canada, and then the rest, you know, wherever Massachusetts. Because, mm -hmm. yeah, because. Um, anyway, I don't want to get into anything about me right now. <laughs> but um, also, um, I also find interesting that you're actually you were born in 1967, October 13th, mm -hmm. which is very uh, to me. I find that very awesome because you know that's three days right before the Roger Patterson Bob Gimlin footage came up about. So it was actually and, uh, one, one week, right? Exactly one week. It was uh, three o'clock in the afternoon, um, October 20th is the. Oh, okay. I was getting. I was thinking the 16th for some reason. Okay, I'm sorry about no, that. But you know, the other but, thing uh, that's interesting is Bob Gimlin's birthday is October 18th. My wow. Father. He told me that one time, so it was like two days before. So what a birthday present, right? That is awesome because you know, hey, 1967, a cryptozoologist was born. <laughs> that's awesome. My so, uh, third. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah, the third. Huh? <laughs> now, uh, Ken, we're we're. Originally, are you from? Because I'm not, you know, I, oh, um, I'm not. Well, the information I pulled up real quick, it's not showing exact location. But are no, you? Uh, it's all good. Uh, my my parents actually were Canadian immigrants. So, um, uh, but I was born in Lansing, Michigan, when my father was a professor at Michigan State University, and uh, I lived in Minnesota until I was maybe 11 or 12. Grew up in the Twin Cities area, and then I've been in Texas. Since 1978, awesome. um, mostly growing up uh, south of Houston there um, on the, in the on the Gulf Coast, and now, now I'm in San Antonio, Texas. Okay, yeah, um, you have you've been dealing with some projects down there as well with the uh, uh, Texas Monster. Uh, um, see, I mean, there's a I know there's a, a whole list you could probably go through right now, because. Um, I'll tell you one of the recent ones. I know a lot of people have been asking about. Uh, I've I've gotten a couple questions about it, and I know I was already curious about it too. Was is your uh, your episode, uh, your series of the missing in Alaska? I know I got people asking about that. Um, to start off with, um, I know that there's been a marathon recently mm -hmm. um, with, with the uh, episodes and stuff. Well, um, now is that a show that's going to continue or come back? Well. Um so far, seven episodes have aired. It started with okay. the first three episodes on History Channel, and then they shifted it over to H2, where we saw the a repeat of the first three plus four new ones. So that's seven so far, but we do have six episodes that have yet to air. And I think those could be airing on H2 as soon as the weekend after uh, next week, or next weekend, I guess, on the 26th yeah. is what I've heard. Uh, so 13 total for season one. As far as there's going to be, you know, if the, whether or not there are going to be more episodes after that in season two, that decision is completely out of my hands. That's up to the, <laughs> the people that pay for it, which is the you know the History Channel folks. So if, if they like right. the way the show's going and if it's getting a good good ratings, then hopefully we'll get a season two. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, I enjoy. I mean, now I'm going to be honest with you. I only got the. I only watched that one episode, the one I actually tagged you in that I actually recorded on my DVR to watch, <laughs> and I was very impressed with it. I really liked that show because. And that one uh, particular episode there, um, when you and the two other gentlemen... By the way, are they with you in each other episode? Yeah, the three of us are a team. They, they put us all together, different backgrounds and perspectives, but uh, every episode, the three of us are working together. Okay, very good. Cause I like how you actually, you know, in the in the show, you guys, how you conduct everything and go into looking for the research, uh, details of evidence. Um, I do have a question. Uh, <laughs> Um, what are right, as far as the, the nest that you guys found in that one episode there? Mm, Harry Man. Um, yeah. Yes, exactly. The Harry Man episode. Now, I believe it was mentioned about it being belonging to a bear, but mm. I don't know. 
because you know I know I was in a discussion with some other people about that nest, and as far as we know, that nest. I mean, it doesn't appear to be anything that a bear would actually make. No, I, mean, I, would, I don't. You know, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure about that either. Now, granted. You guys have a lot of bears up in your neck of the woods. We don't have oh. too many here in Texas, so I don't run across bear sign very often. Right. Um, but uh, you're right, and that was uh, that was definitely a mystery. Uh, it didn't look like a bear den. Um, it looked like something that could have been potentially built by something else. And you know, you you can't ever, I don't think, eliminate the human element on the Sasquatch investigation because pe people, humans, have been known to build you know, blinds and, and kind of makeshift structures in the woods that look very primitive and could almost be interpreted as some kind of animal nest sometimes. I've seen that happen. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, so the weird thing was the meat that was hanging in there now. And again, that's that goes against everything we know about bears. You know, they're not going to hang meat up. They're going to bury it in the ground or cover it up or something. Exactly. So, you know, I don't know. Exactly. You know, we, we really didn't have a good answer for that. It was just, you know, we did detect kind of a, a pungent smell in that area. And um, but I didn't find any tracks or hairs or any other indication that that was a quote unquote Sasquatch nest or any other kind of animal nest. Yeah, that was. I mean, yeah, it was very interesting because I mean, as far as you know, besides the bears up there, do you know what other known animals that inhabit that area? As far well, as uh, do they have mountain lions up they, that way? They, have, they only have, to my understanding, they only have mountain lions in the far southeast Alaska. You know, okay. a little peninsula down there. Um, they haven't strayed much farther north than that because those niches that mountain lions would typically be in are covered by other animals. Now, they do have bobcats. They have uh, wolverines, wolves, of course, foxes, and a host of other kinds of small animals like muskrats and, you know, you name it. So there's a, a huge diversity of wildlife there in Alaska. So, But, again, there's also a lot of people running around even though you're kind of out there in the wilderness, you, you've got people that are that are utilizing that 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 habitat, and they're hunters, and you know we would occasionally run across hunters or hikers or people that were out there just doing their thing, trapping or hunting or you know whatever they're doing. So, um, you know, but the, and, you know, the main thing is the bears, obviously. So you know there are a, there's a huge bear population there. Uh, we came across some black bears at pretty close range, and uh, you know, no problems there. But uh, we never did see a brown bear. We found a sign of bear, you know, brown bear uh, tracks and scratch marks. But as far as like a grizzly or, or anything like that, fortunately, we never ran across any of those. <laughs> yeah. Now that one cast that you guys had gotten off of the Hair Man episode, when you guys took it in, um, yeah, to the one biologist hop, and when he said it was a bear, I mean, I know, of course. You, we can only view certain, you know, so much detail through, you know, be, viewing through a television. But I was, I was a little disappointed to hear that it was a bear track. Simply yeah. because from the way it viewed to me, I was like, that looks like some of the casting tracks I found. Now I'm very familiar with a lot of double step bear tracks. Um, sure. I mean, I have come across a number. Of, Fred will tell you, I, so, you know, even though you know, there's a couple different areas that we focus on here in Virginia, and he, he covers a a very wide range, you know, in his part, his neck of the woods. I've seen them there, and I've seen them out in my woods, which is closer to the West Virginia line. And and now, a lot of the double step bear tracks. There's, uh, I mean, one thing that's very distinct about them. A lot of times you can see the toes in the middle of the track, if not the claws. Mm -hmm. um, now, I know we got some very huge bears around, and I mean, I've seen some okay. monster bears, you know, bear tracks. And as far as I could honestly pounds. rule out, yeah, and maybe even bigger in some areas, but I could honestly say I feel confident that a lot of the tracks I found are belonging to a Bigfoot. I mean, I do have bear tracks uh, that I cast mm -hmm. and, you know, give or take another, you know, like a panther track, but, um, you know, you know did it, that track to you, uh, uh, did it appear to be possibly a belonging to a Bigfoot? Because the reason I'm asking you, even though you take it into a biologist, you know, you know, you know the way I look at it, he may have been a non-believer, and a lot of them like to dismiss, you know, and not even consider the actual thought of it being authentic, belonging to a Sasquatch. Uh, especially being, you know, being possibly a skeptic or a non-believer altogether. I mean, yeah, yeah. Well, you make strong points. Well, the, th the thing is, 
Uh, when we came up on the track, you know, obviously we didn't. I didn't see any claw marks, and that's you know the the bear tracks that we've seen. Most of the bear tracks we've seen uh, in, that I've seen in Canada and elsewhere, you know, the claw marks are pretty pronounced since those are very long and pronounced on a bear, uh, depending on the age of the bear, of course. And then we didn't see, uh, you know, and then one of the toes, you know, that you get the five toes in alignment. Look, I think I have a, a bear cast right here behind me, so we can kind of look at see what we're looking at here. Okay, so you can see the relative. Oh, that's very good. The relative consistency there of the of the toes. Yeah, he's got a wide. Uh, that it's a widespread. Yeah, that the, that looks like an older bear. Okay, maybe right there. I don't remember. I don't know what bear this came from per se, but on the the one we saw, the uh, I guess the outside toe was kind of. It, it seemed like it was more of an angle and it was a little bigger. So it, it almost mm -hmm. had that kind of subjective feel of a of a large toe on a primate. But, right. Um, you guys know as researchers, I mean, it's yeah. hard to find that just slam dunk home run evidence, you know. I mean, if you got something like the, um, see, or the, the back wall, the, the Grays Harbor cast there <laughs> on the far, you know, where you can see yeah. really great detail and uh, dermal ridges and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, most of the tracks that I've found through the years, uh, you know, even many that I believe to be, you know, Bigfoot related, you know, they're they're not going to wow a lot of scientists, you know, they're just going to, it's kind of a, it's nice to add to the collection, but, you know, and it adds to the body of evidence, but, you know, you guys know what I'm saying. I mean, it's, oh, absolutely. there, there are so yeah. many factors, right, in how an animal steps in the ground, the substrate, all those different things, so. Yeah, I mean, because me, I know I find a lot of evidence, and I share it openly, publicly, you know, because especially right here on social media, on Facebook, or, I mean, I share things openly on my timeline, and you know I got a tons of believers and knowers, and then also you have skeptics and total non-believers, and uh, you know I, I'm not ashamed of sharing what I do and what I find, and uh, you know Fred could tell you I know he deals with it, but I deal with it a lot, you know, one way or another, especially at work. You, know, you get the criticism and the uh, the ridicule, but you know it doesn't stop me from doing what I do, so. You know, sometimes it's discouraging to some people trying to do what you do, but, you know, um, but I don't let it stop me, though. I mean... Good, you know, good for you, Daniel. You know, I mean, the, yeah. I think the, the main attribute you're, you have to look for here in terms of being a researcher is you just you can't really worry what people think. <laughs> I mean, that's, right. that ship has sailed, right? I mean, if, if you're the kind of person that's kind of out there anyways and just say, you know, what, I'm going to do my own thing, I don't really, you know, really <laughs> care. Yeah. Uh, how people I've perceive that. I've had you know? Now, yeah, doing what you do, I mean, you deal, you're a cryptozoologist. You deal with a lot of different cryptic, uh, cryptid uh, species. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm sure somewhere along the line, or maybe you still do, I don't know, but do you deal with a lot of criticism yourself? You know, I mean, you've been doing this for a long time. Yeah, sure. I mean, even still, uh, you know, I find a lot of people are accepting, but occasionally I'll run into somebody and they'll just kind of laugh in my face. Like, they think I'm just yeah. insane. And uh, you know that doesn't bother me because I, you know, I get that a lot. <laughs> yeah, th those types of people typically they they haven't been exposed to all of the information that we have, you know, that we've immersed ourselves. Exactly. In. Most people yeah. at home, that you know, the casual person that's heard of Bigfoot, they've seen him on commercials or you know Harry and the Hendersons, and they, you know, they think it is a crack because of the way the media portrays it. But they haven't looked at the evidence. Exactly. Yeah. You know, they haven't spoken to eyewitnesses and, and heard and seen things in the woods. So, I mean, it's it's hard for them to, you know, I, I get that. It's hard for them to kind of accept it from that perspective. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I've had people saying, well, I'm sorry, but you're too far out there. I can't deal with that. You know, <laughs> I think, I mean, I keep things logical. You know, I don't try to, I'm not some of these people that I say, oh, there goes a Bigfoot. He just disappeared in thin air, you know, I'm not, that's not who I am, and it's not what I teach, because actually, I speak up against stuff like that, but... Yeah, no, there's, um, you know, there's, there's different levels, and that's, that brings up another funny story, because one time, uh, a good friend of mine who knew I was into the crypto thing, but he was always very skeptical and just thought it was kind of silly, and then one time I was criticizing something having to do with UFOs or something, some other field, that, and he just kind of laughed in my face, that, that I was poo-pooing this UFO evidence because he's like, dude, you, you look for Bigfoot, you know, like it's all the same, 
level of craziness there, and I didn't see it that way because I was trying to look at it, you know, scientifically. Like, well, there's evidence for for Bigfoot and you know whatever. But um, right, exactly. I'm, a lot of people do relate. You know, you got that group of people that's uh, actually relating UFO aliens with the Bigfoot. You know, and some of them actually strictly believe, hey, this is they out of this world, but. Yeah, I mean, there, there, there is that movement, and that's kind of made things interesting. But going back to you know what we were just talking about, you know, before we get out of that, um, yeah, you know, for every person that says you know you're crazy or laughs at you, I mean, when I'm at events and conferences in different places, I have tons of people that come up to me that have, that, that you know basically confide in me and say, you know what, my sister saw Bigfoot when she was. Eight or my uncle saw him when he was hunting, and you know we never talk about it. We've never really told anyone this. It's just a family secret, you know. But this, the thing about how many people out there have a Bigfoot encounter in the family somewhere, and they just never shared it or reported it. So it's yeah. funny that you say that. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly that. You you know, I'm glad you brought that up too, because you know, you know, it's like me as me in general. You know, you know, not just the whole group thing, but it's like, ever since more, like, I had, you know, not long ago, recently, there was an article that, you know, a newspaper done on me and my group, and it's gone out, you know, it's gotten in the whole county here, and then people's like, when they see your, see me out wearing my, uh, you know, my ECBRO t-shirt, they're like, hey, you, you're the guy from the newspaper, I was like, yep, that's me, <laughs> you know, which was pretty cool, you know, and, and then, there's people that don't share reports. They don't tell you things, but when they learn of, hey, there's somebody that does this, there's somebody that believes in it or researches it, then they get comfortable enough to come open and share something with you. You know, it's like sure. they're, they're waiting for the right time that that they want to share it. They want to tell somebody, but they don't know who. Yeah. And do you, you know, do you ever have, do you ever have people tell you, uh, like if you show them a picture and they'll say it's pareidolia? Yeah, sure. That happens uh, pretty much every day. I'm constantly being. <laughs> yeah. People. Well, well, what I do, what what I did, what I do is, um, I read the definition of pareidolia. So, someone says, "Oh, it's pareidolia." I'll say, "Oh, I'm sorry. You've never seen one, so you don't know what it looks like because your mind cannot comprehend it." And they yeah. look, and they look, and they, they get so twitter pated that they just get disgusted and walk away. Hmm. When you speak honest <laughs> about it. All right. Well, I, I'm afraid I, I heard that the wrong way. You were saying if when people criticize, I've I've never had what I believe to be photographic evidence, so I've never had that that situation. But you know, again, being a very objective and you know, from my perspective, I'm a conventional cryptozoologist, so I come from the school of Grover Krantz and some of those hardcore science guys. You know, the, the photographic evidence is just it's so it's becoming frustratingly less and less valuable in our field because you know, unless someone hands you that slam dunk home run photograph where your jaw just drops to the floor and you say, holy crap, you know, if you have to draw a red line around something and blow it up a hundred times and, you know, <laughs> unfortunately that's just, if it's, well, it's well, got to be, you know, the, the level of evidence for Bigfoot has to be incredibly, it's incredibly high bar. And yeah, because the evidence is. Yeah, because see, in my, yeah, situ you, in my situation, I had a, a photograph that was taken off a video that was about 10 feet from me. Mm -hmm. And I never seen it, and Daniel sent it to me. And what it was, it was a, um, uh, either it was an adult squatch with a juvenile on his shoulder looking over top of his head. Mm -hmm. And I never seen it, I never saw it. What I was doing, I was looking for deer kill that day, you know, squatch, you go, you know, uh, where, where squatch you go out and they do a deer kill. What I was doing was looking for signs of it, you know. And I had the video camera, you know, in one area, and I had it pointed to the right. And I heard something less. I kept camera. I just turned my head. Mm -hmm. I turned back around, you know, in the video. And I sent the video to Daniel, and Daniel clowned it. And the way I see it, if people, if, if, if someone has never, ever seen a squatch, they're, they're not going to know what, they, what it looks like. They're going to, like you said, Harry and Hendersons and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, that's yeah. yeah, that's well, that's true. And, you know, it's funny that, you know, Fred brought that up because, you know, I, I'll tell you, Ken, I'm one of those people, I'm not, I'm probably one of the last ones to jump on a, you know, a picture to say, you know, if that's a Bigfoot or whatever or whatever. 
because you know, I've seen a lot of bogus pictures out there, and I've seen stuff that where you know I gave my honest, you know, two cents about it, and and especially with what Fred had in his video, I mean, I was I got to be honest with you, I really found that it, I found that to be incredible because I mean because I know the neck of woods that he goes into, I found enough evidence to support enough of his claims, and for one thing, but. I've gone, you know, I've looked at that picture. I didn't have to stare at that picture very long. It, as soon as I noticed that, I was like, wow, Fred, check this out. You know, because in this picture, in this one particular picture, which may, later on I can share it to you out, um, through Messenger, um, it, this is what stood out to me. The head, the, the heavy eyebrow ridge, the nose, and, I mean... To me, it was clearly a face, and if you study the rest of the picture, all, you know you got, you know you got this tree, you know the bushes and some of the foliage from the, you know limbs and trees, leaves, whatever. If you look below the head, it almost looks like you can see the wide shoulders kind of slope down, you know. Um, but you know, out of pictures, yeah, I'm pictures. You're, you know, what you said, you know, you don't get a lot of phot photographic evidence. Or, you know, and, and then, like, with, you know, it made sense exactly what you said about there's a high bar for a big for evidence, period. That's just my, but, uh, you know, that's just my opinion, like, right? And, um, you know, I respect right, everyone else's I agree opinion. With you too. But, you know, if your objective is to prove that Bigfoot exists to the world, which I think is kind of like the holy grail for all of us that research, right? Wouldn't we love that feeling of satisfaction of having right. a scientist face in that? It does exist. Then you have <laughs> right. to have some pretty damn impressive evidence. You know, and short of drunk, dropping a body down onto a onto an examination table, you know, um, but photographic evidence can be valuable. It does add to the the overall body of evidence. But I'm still right. waiting and still haven't seen that that home run image since like the Patterson film and maybe the Freeman footage. You know, people are constantly sending me photos, and and oftentimes they'll build it up before they send it to me. Oh, this this is it. This is going to be the clearest, most close up, best Bigfoot photo you've ever seen. And then when I get it, I can't. You know, I can't endorse it. Yeah. Like, like, you know, I see all kinds of things. Yeah. In it, so. Yeah. Which well, makes yeah. sense because you know you got a reputation, and, and you know, and that's how I try to be. I um, I try to you know be honest with people, and and like Fred know if Fred shares something with me or tells me something, he knows I'll tell him. If I don't agree, I'm going to tell Fred. You know, and I would expect the same back from him too. Like mm -hmm. especially, but you know, with anything, pictures, a claim, you know, um, or anybody in general, if they share something with me, I was like, I had one gentleman that was sharing pictures with me, and there was making circles. You know, if you got to put a circle to see something, it's not worth sharing. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, it might be depending on who you're talking to. You know what I'm saying? Like the three right. of us, we can you know put those photos out there, but. You know, people that are posting them on Bigfoot websites, like, this is evidence, check this out. You know, we talk, how did you kick off this whole interview talking about how people that look at us and, you know, they're kind of, you know, judgmental of what we do. Well, the more that people put ambiguous evidence out there and try to push it, you know, the, the worse I think it makes the field look. I think I really wish people would focus more on the physical evidence because if you've got primates running around in the woods that weigh several hundred pounds that are seven feet tall, they're leaving a lot of signs behind. They're leaving a lot of the droppings and hair and tracks and all kinds of things that's, you know, quite a level above photographic evidence in terms of being scientifically valid. Right. Um, now, what do you think, I mean, I know a lot of people use audio for evidence, and that's mm -hmm. something, I mean, I've done it a little, little bit here in the past, but up to recently I've been doing a lot more of it. Um, and I've actually gotten some very interesting stuff off of them, and it's actually out there in the woods. It's been my audio recorders. I've been out for the last three days now, and along with two trail cameras in two different locations. Um, but as far as audio, I mean, unless you know how to clearly identify your known species, I mean, do you do you find audio as any bit of a credible evidence at all? As far as um, you know, you know if, it could be. Maybe I, I think a, a skosh more credible than photographic evidence because I know at least a couple of situations where audio evidence has been studied, you know, like the Sierra sounds, for example. Supposedly, uh, Ron Moorhead and, and Al Berry had those uh, analyzed by some scientists. Um, there was a guy named um, 
Dr. Robert Benson down at Texas A&M University here in Texas that was doing a audio analysis of, of so-called Sasquatch audio calls and they are able to, to determine some things by looking at you know a spectral analyzer where you're looking at all the audio waves and say could a human make that frequency right, and right. something has to be incredibly powerful to create this volume or these decibels or whatever so I, I think that audio evidence could be a little bit more valuable than photographic evidence but um, you know there's there's also the possibility of a, you know a hoax of some kind unfortunately and that's how a lot of skeptics are going to look at that kind of thing is you know and then you have yeah I agree and that makes a lot of sense because a lot of times and I think Fred does the same thing when I take my audio recorder you know it's just a simple digital audio recorder and you know it comes with a little sleeve pouch and a lot of times I find places like hollow trees and logs uh, that I can wedge it into and let it stick out, you know, stick in where it blends in. So I, you know, that's exactly how I have mine now. It's sitting in a little hollow crevice inside of a tree. Um, but yeah, I've gotten, you know, different audios of a lot of our known wildlife, such as uh, mm -hmm. I've gotten barred owls, ki a pack of coyotes going off. Um, let's see. Uh, and I have actually a couple unidentified, file, excuse me, unidentified howls that hmm. I got. And one of my howls, at the end of it, if you listen very carefully, it has what it sounds like a tree knock. And I do have tree knock uh, audios, which a lot of them, I'll take them, I'll upload them. You know, they're actually on my SoundCloud. Uh, but um, so yeah, I'm working on trying to collect more audio to try to, you know, see if I can learn more from it, but. Um, but yeah, I was just I was curious about the uh, your take on audio. I mean, um, it's all all evidence is valuable in some way, you know. Anything that can add to that body of evidence somehow, um, you know, is values, you know. But um, you know, I, I'm I'm I was still waiting because I have these people that have these claims of cohabitation that they've got eight Sasquatches living on their property or whatever and I'm like man send me some droppings send me some hair send me the, if there's eight Sasquatches in your property they're leaving a lot of stuff biological stuff behind right and unfortunately no one's ever able to produce that it's always just kind of uh, you know have so, you ever have you ever seen um, uh, the feces of a Sasquatch or a seemingly of Sasquatch I don't. Th I don't believe that I've seen that. No. Oh, okay. you, have you seen some? I believe you've seen some. No, that's why. Well, no. You know, some people say, well, it looks like human. Some people say it looks like a bear droppings. I don't know. I mean, I, I, you know, mainly, mainly what I find in my area is bear. You know, but I, I wouldn't know what it looked like if I seen it. You know. Yeah, that's the thing. Now, I've had a, I had one gentleman send me uh, a photograph recently on his property. He believes he's got Sasquatch droppings and. It looked to me like, you know, a large grazing animal. You know, it was a very loose, to get too descriptive, we're talking about poop on your show. Sorry, Daniel. It was very, it looked kind of like, a, it was like a cow patty or a horse crap, and it had a lot of, it had a lot of grass in it. It was basically, you can look at the content of, of feces, right, and say, figure out what something's been eating. So if it's, if it's a lot of grass and stuff, and I, I know Bigfoot, is, is supposedly omnivorous, so it does eat some vegetable matter, I'm sure, and other things too. But you know, I was a little bit critical to, of the guy, and I said, I think this is, you know, a large grazing animal. And he said, Well, how do you know? And he, he, I said, You know, you're right. But I did do some uh, research on gorilla droppings after that, and they looked surprisingly like standard human droppings, um, just larger. So I would assume that it's a fair presumption that if you were talking about a Sasquatch, which is an omnivorous animal, which is a higher primate, maybe a hominin, then it eats similar things to us, and it's bigger than us. Then maybe its droppings would look like ours, but bigger. Does that make sense? I don't know. Actually, I, I don't know. That's I <laughs> yeah, it makes a lot of sense to me because I mean, yeah. I come across a lot of various different styles of bear scat, and I mean, I've seen it look like it. It was like diarrhea, like you said, a cow patty from mm -hmm. a, you know. Um, I've actually. In two different times, I've seen it look almost like horse manure, but yet a big giant pile of a very large dog. And actually, this past weekend, and this is something I couldn't rule out a bear, but there's one particular tree in this one area that me and Fred call the picnic area. We, uh, I was out there. I was actually going to get my one of my trail cameras that were out there at the time, 
you know, I always look in that area because I have found tracks in that area. Um, I know there's been bears come through there a lot, deer come through there, uh, coyotes, because I've gotten picked up all of them on my trail cameras out there. Mm -hmm. um, but there's one tree that's in the back right before you go into the woods. Um, tree, all right, a lot of the limbs were broke, but not just broke, but they were twisted. Mm -hmm. And the highest one was over eight feet tall. Oh, and it was standing up. Yeah, it's all broken up, twisted, yeah. and I mean, I reached my hand up above my head. My hand, reached, when I'm standing, I'm six foot tall when I stand, but my hand, you know, that was probably over seven foot, and I was probably a good two feet away from the where the limb was twisted at the top. Hmm. And I was like, and I didn't know, I didn't see the, the bear's cut until I was looking around. I was looking for around for tracks, and I happened to look down, and almost a basketball-sized pile of scat, and it was in large forms of what looked like almost human looking poop <laughs> and I was like wow I'm looking around I did not see tracks though that's the thing I found very weird and odd but I found that and I always dissect my scat to see what they've been eating mm -hmm. and a lot of times with bears you could see the seeds uh, the berries or whatever they've been eating this one here looked like I don't know it didn't look it looked almost like like dog canine but uh, or a mixture between almost like a human look to it. Mm -hmm. and I will share something else that's a little embarrassing, but <laughs> but I actually no, I ain't gonna get, I ain't gonna go into that part. But no, I didn't taste it. No, I ain't gonna say that. <laughs> no, but, uh, no, I didn't see nothing that, that indicated any sign of it. Well, this don't look like bear scat because usually bears always have seeds in their their scat. Yeah, no, but, uh, no, I, no I, found, I found that very mysterious. But yeah, no, go I ahead, found, Fred. I'm sorry. I found no, I found a pile that was weird, uh, that was mostly tree bark, hmm. and, and it looked like it, it could have been a bear, it could have been a squatch, it could have been a human. I don't know, but it was very massive, was something about like like that, but it was yeah. it was like eighty percent tree bark. Hmm. You know, in uh, Finland, uh, their version of Bigfoot, which I believe they call a yeti up in Finland. Uh, yeah. There's a version that they, that is known as the tree eater. That's oh, really? the that's the the English translation of the name for it. So maybe there's huh. a connection there in what you're talking about. Maybe they do eat bark. Well, I th I thought porcupine, but we don't have porcupines down this far. Cause see, in this area is right off the Blue Ridge Parkway, mm -hmm. and and they travel up and down the parkway. And my area is mostly the uh, birthing area. Because you find more juvies than anything else, but I, I've seen a lot of scat. But that is one pile of scat I've never, ever, ever. And I know every animal that's in Virginia, and this I cannot figure out. Hmm. I don't know what it is, but it was it was an eighty percent tree bark. That's interesting. I should have got hmm. some. I should have got some sense to Daniel. Hmm. You know, not not to uh, dwell on on Bigfoot poop for too long here, but there's a great story. <laughs> You guys may know um, Bob Titmus, of course, considered one of the greatest Bigfoot trackers ever. Uh, you know, back in the 50s and 60s, he was working with Renee DeHinden and John Green and Tom Slick and all those guys. Yeah. Um, he uh, claimed that he had found a spot where Bigfoot was pooping, and he considered it like kind of their area. And uh, he led uh, the the Bigfoot research team, Renee DeHandon and Peter Byrne and some of those guys on a wild goose chase to find this Bigfoot pooping area and they did ultimately figure out that it was horse crap. So, you know, even oh, the great wow. Bob Titmus wasn't sure what Bigfoot poop would look like and uh, to this day we, you know, we really don't know. Now, one last note, of course, DNA evidence from SCAT is very difficult. It has to be very fresh and uh, apparently it has to be from kind of the, uh, the part that's sort of the stem, <laughs> so to speak. So mm. um, it, it would be awesome if someone could derive DNA, Bigfoot DNA, from, from scat. But um, it seems very difficult. But I still think it's pretty important evidence that people can find something like that, uh, that something that was unusual enough like that that you could, you know, maybe show to a scientist and say, identify this. And if they couldn't, then, you know, maybe you've got something. I don't know, but it was very, it was very interesting. I've never seen anything like it, and I've been and I'm in the woods ninety nine percent of the time because mm -hmm. I'm disabled, so that's all I got to do. And this is then this is right over 
behind the picnic area, back in the ridge area, because it goes up toward the parkway and everything. But it was it was interesting though, you know. Hmm. And everything. Cool. Hmm. Now, one of the questions I do have for you, Karen. Um, I'll be right. In, uh, in, yeah, an individual wants to know as far as have you ever had a sighting of Bigfoot? Or actually, uh, let's let's uh, I'm going to open that a little bit more. Since you are a cryptozoologist and you look into more of a variety of different cryptid species, um, not just Bigfoot, but have you had any sighting of anything Bigfoot or any other related cryptid? No, I've I've never seen a cryptid with my own eyes. Um, and you know, I've spent quite a bit of time in the field researching in certain areas, so I understand a lot of it is being in the right place at the right time. The closest I've come. Um, is back in 2003, I believe, I was with some other researchers in North Texas, and uh, we were at a remote little lake where there had been a lot of sightings, and we were there doing an investigation. And right after the sun went down, we were kind of hiking around the lake, and we heard these vocalizations. And uh, I recorded those. Um, and to this day, I mean, that's the most convincing thing that I've experienced because the, the, the nature of these vocalizations, they were so loud and deep, and they definitely had primate characteristics. I, I have heard primates in the wild. I've heard howler monkeys and other primates in Central America and other places. So I know just, you know, you know moreover, you, know, you go to the zoo and you hear gorillas and other apes and, and calls and things like that. So this awesome. sounded like a large ape or primate, very loud, we couldn't get a visual sighting of it though, because it was it was close to us, probably 40 yards away, but it was in some thick brush, and uh, we didn't have nerve to to work through that thick brush at night and, and try to get a look at this thing. We did find some other evidence, tracks and some mutilated turtle sh shells and other things that that kind of convinced me that I probably heard Bigfoot or Sasquatch. I mean, I can't, I really have no other explanation for what I heard, but. Uh, I, again, I did, since I didn't see it with my own eyes, I can't say conclusively that's what it was. Hmm. Okay. Um, now, as far as hearing, you know, since you actually heard, you know, got to hear known primate and their vocalizations, one thing I know I've experienced on more than one occasion, and, um, you know, very close to at night. Fred's w been with me when we've heard him. But, um, now, as far as a lot of people you know, reported hearing or getting whoops off of audio, mm -hmm. I've gotten them both off of audio and actually live, you know, being out in the woods, usually in the evenings, late uh -huh. at night. Yeah. Now, have, have as far as hearing whoops, now I believe, you know, because I know a whoop is actually a, a common primate vocalization. Uh, I mean, would you say a, hearing whoops in the woods, could, it, could that be any other possible known wildlife creature? Um, no, that's a great question. I've heard the whoops too. That's uh, probably the most common thing that I've heard in, in other areas other than those sounds that I heard that time. Um, definitely had that primate feel. Now the only thing I can think of is that there might be some birds, uh, particularly like waterfowl type of things that might have occasionally a sound that maybe doesn't sound exactly like a whoop, but you know when you consider you're maybe a little bit of a distance away and the sound is echoing through the trees and there's other ambient noise in the background, you know, all of those factors I think can mislead you a little bit, but um, just because the whoops are so commonly reported by Bigfoot researchers you know, around the country and around North America, I think it's a fair assumption that that is probably a, a, a characteristic of a Sasquatch call. Whistles are very common, of course, mm -hmm. um, whoops. Um, and then, then, then you get into your howls and your screams, right? Those are the what, what, those are kind of the yeah. ones that we always hear about, and that are, and that's corroborated by different researchers. So, right. But I have yeah, heard, and I'm sure you guys have heard. I'm sorry, real, real quick. We've all yeah. heard animals that we're familiar with make sounds that we've never heard them make before, and that can right. be a really weird situation. But when they're in distress or weird things are going on, sometimes you hear an animal make a sound that it's just not typical of what you're expecting. And if you don't actually see it with your own eyes, you could think it was something pretty strange. Absolutely. Yeah, because one, yeah, because one night me and Daniel was up in his area, and just for pure heck of it, I said, "Well, I'm gonna try something." So, I, so I, I yelled, "I went, hey!" And within 50 yards of us, I got a response about 10 seconds later. 
we don't know what it is, but you know, they was there. We heard we heard something one night, mm-hmm. and I got back here to the house, and I looked on. I went under every animal known in the state of Virginia, as far as from adults to babies, as far as uh, distress sounds. I never heard this sound before. We listened to it for about well, about five or ten minutes, Daniel. Yeah, at least uh, for fairly, probably a little, a good twenty minutes or so. Yeah, because yeah, we walked I, back and forth before we went actually behind that area, because that area was uh, it's very dark, uh, very thick and heavy vegetated. I mean, but there's areas behind it. If you know where to go, there's there is areas where you could see where wildlife and other game work their way through. Because um, actually, somewhere in that general areas, I mean, I got a trail cam a little bit further up behind there. But, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, if there's a lot of animals. Because I've seen bear signs back there. I know bears go in there a lot. And you, bear and deer is common for being back there. And also uh, panthers. Because, you know, that same day we had a panther cross the road on us way up, way up the road. Which I thought it was a black bear at first when I first saw it because it was jet black. <laughs> so we started walking into that direction and it shot off into the woods. You could see how long and skinny it was. So. Yeah, we, found, and, uh, we, found, we found a track and it was a massive track. Hmm. It was a cat track, definitely. Hmm. Yeah, I, and actually, I, about two miles away from there, but a couple months before that, we had our uh, ECB, uh, annual ECBRO expedition. And uh, I've actually got tracks I've casted from there before so uh, that belonged to a panther so which was very uh, interesting to come across it was actually right outside of our camp mm. and I believe they were I believe they were very fairly fresh so <laughs> um, let's see well, right now the game uh, commission right now the game commission says that there's no mountain lions or panthers indigenous to Shando Valley but contraire there's over a thousand folks that I know of in here in Virginia has got photographs of them. So I think it's a scare tactic, more or less. Well, that's going on everywhere, though, right? Everywhere yeah. in the eastern U.S., you, the official yeah. stance is there's no mountain lions indigenous here or endemic, but you, yeah. you still the reports just come in on a regular basis. And I, you know, I think that's a case where I have friends, and you probably do too, that have worked for the park system. And uh, you know they, they don't want their job to get they're they're already pretty much underpaid for how much work they have to do how much ground they have to cover so you know any animal that's being reported that's not on their list that they have to manage they you know they generally they don't want to acknowledge that because it's just more work for them you know so it's, yeah it's and kinda, the force that we can, yeah go ahead oh I'm sorry I didn't mean to interrupt you uh, no nah, just the area that we cover I mean there's over a hundred and thirty thousand acres of that national forest that we we can uh that we work through and and of course I, there's parts of it I have not touched foot on and because there's areas where I've actually gone where it's most unlikely where someone else would actually travel I like when I travel as far as when I say travel I'm talking about on foot and hike uh I like to believe that I go where it's unlikely where someone else is going to go because it's inconvenient or too far for somebody or some areas that might be hard for somebody to get through. Those are the kind of areas I like to venture into because, you, you know, yeah. that's, to me, that's where a creature that wants to stay elusive or undetected is going to try to remain, you know. So, I, and actually going deep in the woods, that's where I found a lot of my evidence, you know, so. Well, that um, makes sense. Yeah, cause yeah, we have both. We have over just in. See, my area and Daniel's area is the same area, but they're like twenty miles apart, and we got like we got way, way over a hundred and thirty thousand plus acres mm. of uh, national forest. We got net. We got George Washington, Jefferson, and Shenandoah National Parks or forests in the state of Virginia. So around around like like in the Shenandoah Valley, you know, it's like a big salad bowl, you know, but it's nothing but mountains. All up and down the East Coast in Virginia is nothing but mountains. So, you know, they have, the App- we have Appalachian Trail too. So, there's plenty of ways that a squatch can, or a family, a group of some cryptids can be supported and not, not be, and not be uh, seen before. Sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'll yeah. buy that. <laughs> yeah. So, Where there's more wilderness, there's a more, there's a higher probability of, of things like that around. No doubt about that. <laughs> so, uh, Ken, is, uh, right now, um, I know you're a very busy guy, so um, right now, uh, what, uh, 
what kind of projects are what you might uh, are you working on or what might be working on or what do you got coming up? I know you're getting ready to go to the uh, Mothman Festival here coming up right this month. Yep. Thanks for mentioning. Yeah, I'll be at the Mothman Festival this coming weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm giving a lecture at three o'clock on Saturday uh, on flying humanoids globally. You know the the flying humanoid phenomenon, the topic of my last book. Um, and I'll, but I'll be there all weekend with my table set up, signing books and, and meeting people. Um, awesome. Beyond the, thank you. Beyond that, we have the Texas Bigfoot Conference is coming up October 9th or 10th, I believe, in uh, Jefferson, Texas. We had a really great turnout for that last year. That's a pretty next to the Ohio Bigfoot Conference. I think it's one of the bigger Bigfoot conferences in the country. They've been doing it for a while, and we always have a good turnout. I'll be speaking there with uh, you know Lyle Blackburn, John Kirk. Nick Redfern and uh, others, and then beyond that, you know, I've got I've uh, been writing on some, been working on some writing projects. I have a new book coming out next year. I just turned that in. Um, I'm writing an article for a uh, or a chapter for a Bigfoot compilation. Different authors mm. contributing to that, and um, you know, I have investigations that I'm working on on a regular basis now. Uh, one of the things, one of the main focal points of my research, of course, are flying cryptids, particularly thunderbirds. And uh, I've been receiving a lot of reports lately from the areas around me here in San Antonio and Austin, Texas, which is where I, I live here for a reason. There are a lot of thunderbird reports around here. And what I've is, just gotten some recently, so I'm investigating those right now. What is a thunderbird? Thunderbird is based on the name Thunderbird is uh, an anglicized version of a uh, many Native American Condor. cultures have these legends of these giant birds uh, referred to as enormous eagles or super eagles much larger than a any known species of eagle or condor or anything else. Uh, these wow. birds are described as having a wingspan 15 to 20 feet across. Uh, the witnesses describe wow. them as having dark colored feathers and you know, kind of a hooked beak like a like a raptor type of bird and um, you know there are many Native American legends but there are also a lot of modern sightings and most of the wow. modern sightings on record stem from uh, the states of Illinois north central Pennsylvania and here in South Texas they're, they are all over wow. But uh, that's where we get a lot of reports of these Thunderbirds. So that's something I'm actively investigating. Cool. Well, that's very interesting. I'll have to keep my eyes in the sky then. <laughs> uh, are they yeah, seen more? Apparently they're seen more up. during the daytime. Yeah. Because, I mean, where me and Fred go a lot, I mean, there's not a lot of wilderness around us. And, I mean, I mean, right where I go, we got bald eagles that fly overhead, very large bald eagles. So, I mean, I'll keep my eyes open for, you know, for sure. So. <laughs> Okay, well, a large, a large bald eagle can have a wingspan eight feet across, so you're looking for something twice as big as that. And oh, yeah, well, that should stand out pretty well, then, if I see something. <laughs> yeah, similar to Bigfoot, um, and actually, my new book, there are several sightings from Virginia, uh, so if you guys oh. get a chance to pick up my new book when it comes out next year, there are several Thunderbird reports from Virginia that I include in there. Um, oh. But going back to the Thunderbird, one last thing I want to say Similar to Bigfoot, there are fossil forms that resemble thunderbirds. And I'm referring to these massive birds known as the pteratorns. And uh, we've, uh, we've discovered hundreds of fossils from these giant pteratorn birds that lived during the late Pleistocene epoch up until about 10,000 years ago. And they had wingspans about one American species, North American species, had a wingspan of 18 feet across. Wow. And superficially they would have had, they were they're kind of like the ancestors to modern vultures and condors, so they would have had features very similar to what are described with, with the thunderbirds. So the most prevalent theory with regard to the thunderbirds is that these are surviving pockets of uh, territorns, you know, maybe just a small populations that are living in remote areas. But mm -hmm. uh, we have very little physical evidence for thunderbirds. No one's ever found a giant feather or bone or nest or egg or anything like that. You know, it's all uh, basically eyewitness descriptions and, uh, uh, some, you know, weak, weak photographic evidence. Mm. You know, and what a lot of people don't realize is, I mean, you know, you got a lot of people that, which I call, and I'm not the only one that calls them, you got armchair researchers, which, which I take that back because, you know, there's people that can't help or can't get out there. 
I'm going to try to rephrase that because uh, I got friends that can't get out there. But you got those who don't bother trying to get out there. You know, not that they can't get out there, they don't bother trying to get out there. But um, you got people like I'm going to say more along, along the skeptic line. Um, that I, I'm trying to be careful how I word that. I don't want people to take me the wrong way how I'm how I'm trying to present it. But there's people that or claim they go out in the woods and they hunt. You know, they've been spending all their life out in the woods. They never seen anything or whatnot. But you know, there's so much, you know, land, so much territory, so much vast forest that's not really explored. You know, and but we're always discovering something there. And there's so much mystery that people don't realize what's really out there, because. Um, you know, I mean, I grew up, I've been in the woods since I was a young kid, you know, hunting with my father or whatnot, or just playing in the woods. But, you know, just because I've been out in the woods, you know, yeah, I never seen nothing as a child growing up. But the more you the more you get out there and start exploring and actually start looking for particular evidence and signs, then the whole new world opens up, you know, because that's the thing. A lot of people, when they're out there and they say that they don't see nothing because they're not looking for it. They don't know what to look for. Um, I'm going to be honest with you. When I first got involved and started, I wasn't sure what to look for, but I started paying a lot more close attention to little details that really start standing out. I started finding the foot tracks, and, and uh, I mean, I've got a small collection so far, and I'm proud of what I found, you know. And I stand behind, and I still I stand confident in my findings. Um, there's some things, yeah. I'll, if I can't if I can't explain what I found, um, you know, I'll be honest. If I'm not sure if it what it is, I'll be honest. But um, I'm confident in knowing what I found. Um, and I come across a lot of bear tracks and you know various evidence, and I can rule out pretty much a majority of wildlife sometimes. But um, but I'm like I said before earlier, I'm not the first one to jump on. The Bigfoot train and say, hey, it claimed that everything was done by a Bigfoot, you know, because I always do try to, uh, you know, rule out the obvious, and I try to use science, science to, you know, confirm what I found, you know, what it might be. But um, yeah, but you know, as far as nature itself, there's so much that we haven't, you know, we have yet to discover. I mean, down in the Amazon and the jungles, you know, look at it in Africa. <laughs> there's new discoveries being made all the time. So, but um. Yeah, but that's interesting, you know. There's certain other cryptids and stuff, you know. Some I will admit I don't believe in, but yeah, I do keep a, I do try to keep an open mind on other species. And uh, but yeah, something like a giant bird, uh, the Thunderbird, I can believe that. I mean, I don't see how that's hard to believe, you know. Just especially prehistoric era. If we look in our prehistoric era, what existed back then, why can't something still exist today? You know, there's so much. You know, history or, you know, we have crocodiles, alligators, and, you know, um, what is, uh, ah, I can't, I lost my train of thought. But there's so many animals and creatures that were there back then that we know of still today. But there's some animals that are just smarter than others that stay low and stay undetected. But, um, but yeah, there's, two, there's two arguments to that because you know I get what you're saying. Obviously, I'm investigating evidence of Thunderbirds because there is evidence to investigate. There are reports coming in. There are native legends and so forth. But there are strong arguments from the other side, and this is the key to being an objective researcher. There are strong arguments against why something like a Thunderbird could have survived 10,000 years ago without us finding it yet. You know what I'm saying? So, um, there, and there's not a lot of physical evidence, which is very frustrating. But, you know, the way evolution ha happens and, and, you know, different animals, they find their niche. And if they can find a specific niche within a specific ecosystem, then they're successful and they do well. But, you know, the niches and the ecosystems of the, of the late Pleistocene 10,000 years ago are very different than they are today. Not drastically different. Right. Not millions of years ago. But still, very different. So, you know, there are many animals that did survive from the Pleistocene, the ones that were able to adapt uh, to the changing environment. And, you know, the, the question is something like a Teratorn, you know, would it have been able to survive 10,000 years with all of the changes that have taken place? Hmm. Especially, maybe, yeah. Maybe not, like our, you know. 
Right, exactly. For like, for example, our weather, the climate, all the changes from way Just back. Just the impact that humans have had on the society. You know, deforestation yeah. and pollution and global warming and all the things that have happened over the, the last 150 years. You know, that, that think about how many species have gone extinct uh, due to the you know the human impact on the environment. So, not to Absolutely. be a downer there, but you know, that's that's something to consider well, as well. Oh, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense, too. So, But, uh, by the way, I wanted to uh, say hello to Scott Marlowe. He's on board right here. I know you guys are going to be, I ain't going to say you guys are going to be sharing a table, but I know he'll be having uh, his collection of books out there next year as well, or nearby uh, at the Moffin Festival. Uh, Scott, I don't see your face on there, but I know you're listening. <laughs> well, I but, don't know um, if you can I hear me. To... Oh, actually, I hear you loud and clear. Okay, so the rest of them do. Hi, yeah, Scott. You, hey, yeah, Kenny. feel free to jump on in, uh, Scott, if you have any questions for... Uh, well, this is the first uh, time I've been on this thing, so I'm not sure how it works. <laughs> okay, now you, uh, you... Yeah, you're doing just fine. We hear you loud and clear. And, uh, but uh, if you want to show your face, I mean... You, I, I'm uh, like I, I've got my computer partially disconnected and the webcam's offline, so... Oh, not a problem, not a problem. So... Uh, it's almost like you called in as a caller, which <laughs> so yeah, you're fine. <laughs> so um, yeah, so you'll be having your set of books here with uh, along with Ken, right? Uh, well, Ken's got a table of his own, and then uh, we're uh, my the son and I are coming up, and we're we went at a table for Pangea Institute that they told me is going to be up there near the the uh, Mothman statue somewhere. So okay. uh, we'll we'll have put out some books too. So uh, actually, uh, uh, two Pangea fellows are going to be there. Awesome. Uh, Ken and myself, and uh, we'll both have tables. Okay, and then uh, if I'm not mistaken, you and Ken and uh, maybe a few other gentlemen, you guys are meeting up for uh, what breakfast and lunch prior to that. We've got a dinner scheduled at eight o'clock on uh, uh, Saturday. Uh, at uh, what is it, Cusina Tuscany, I think it is, over in Galapagos, and okay. uh, then we have uh, got a Sunday thing. If any of the fans want to join us for lunch over at uh, Remos the Hot Dogs over in Galapagos, which is just okay. across the river from uh, Point uh, Pleasant. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Huh. Well, I just had a random thought come in my head, and I wanted to ask Ken about this. Uh, hey, if you go up to Alaska, I know you know you're, you're probably paid to go up there. To, you know, the do your show, but would you ever volunteer to come do a uh, expedition here in Virginia in the future? Yeah, I, I love to get out and uh, work with other researchers around the country. I think that's always a great experience to see how other people are conducting research. So, yeah, I've uh, you know, okay. I would love to come out there sometime and look up with you guys. Yeah, I mean we, I mean we don't get too fat. Basically, you know, basically what you do is what we do. I mean. When we get out in the field, I mean, our main important tools are our eyes and ears, and you know, I mean, yeah, we got some equipment and gear. And it's slowly being built up, but you know, we get out and explore, and a lot of times things pop out and stand out, you know, to us. You know, things you hear things that you you're constantly questioning. Did you hear that? What's that? You know, you know, and we we always try to rule out what we hear out in the woods or what we might see in different events. I mean, because uh, last year. Here, there's six of us that experience an encounter, and and even after we experience it, we will, when we made it back to our camp on foot, we were all trying to debunk the whole situation. But um, I, told, but, uh, there, I told you, <laughs> I told you. <laughs> yeah, there was an awesome thing. We'll never forget it though. Uh, we tried to rule everything else out when we had our encounter, but but that area right there, I mean. It's it's a very active area. I've had a lot of activity in that area, and I um, mean I've been working on strategies. To, you know, if I had just the right uh, amount of people, where I could actually almost surround that corner of that mountain right there. And uh, <laughs> I mean, there's so much I want to do, and I have planned to do. But it's, if I get, uh, like I said, if I get the right crew and the right people willing to dedicate and participate, that'd be awesome. You know, but but yeah, you're welcome out here anytime, Ken. I mean. You know, I'm working on trying to plan something. You know, we've had two expeditions. You know, start. You know, 2014. We just had one back in June, and I haven't officially planned nothing for 2016 yet because I'm actually considering trying to uh, go to the Ohio Bigfoot Conference next year. Or so, cool. Um, 
Yeah, because, I mean, I'll have a lot of vacation time to take off and do a lot of big floating. <laughs> so I'm working on it. But, uh, but yeah, maybe uh, I can get in discussion with you later about that. Maybe we'll plan yeah. something out, yeah. in it, plan it ahead of time, you know. Yeah, just keep me in the loop. Sure. We'll figure something out. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Because where we go camping, you know, there's – it's not a normal campground. If you, if you find a spot that's cleared open in the woods, that's where you go. <laughs> uh, I mean, there is a campground about two or three miles from there. But, you know, and then, then you got the lake in the middle of the mountains out there, which they call it a lake. It's more of a fishing pond to me, but because um, <laughs> the lakes I'm used to, I grew up around, they're, yeah, they're miles apart, uh, miles. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so, yeah, that's something I, I, I was thinking about asking before we even got on here. So, but Because um, I, I see a lot of the work you do. I um, mean, I like what you do, and, uh, and I like how you have a, I mean, you you got a uh, open mind, but yet you have you think logical about trying to rule things out, and you know I like the way you think. So uh, because we definitely need somebody like you around, um, and I want you keep up keep up what you're doing. And uh, well, thanks, man. I appreciate the very kind words. And uh, yeah, uh, like I said, sometime if I can get up to Virginia in the near future, oh, yeah. let's uh, let's hook up. Absolutely, there's a lot going on here, and I I know. You know my other fellow researchers that live down south, uh, uh, southern part of Virginia. They're always reporting back to me. My buddy Tracy, for the very first time, had his first sighting, and uh, he described it to us. I um, mean, the poor guy was shook up after he saw what he saw, and you know, I mean, he started filming after he seen what he seen, and you could see, you could see the the, the thrill or, or the. How I don't know how to put, even explain it. He was frightened. It, whatever he saw was frightening him, and you know he described it and he knows what he saw. And I'll tell you why he's incredible because you know he's a he's a Christian man. He's got morals and he's somebody that does not lie or look for attention. Mm -hmm. And for what he said he saw, I believe him without a doubt. And because um, he happened to be like you said in the right place at the right time, he never expected anything like that to happen to him. And this wasn't even in his research area. This was probably over an hour away from where he lives, where he was actually on. He was working, and he happened to have some free time to kill, and he decided to go walk in this area that he's actually had reports from before. And sure enough, it happened to him. But, but that's something I have yet to happen to me is a daytime in, uh, encounter. So maybe one day, eventually, it will happen. So <laughs> very cool, but, man. Um, when you yeah. Have you have when you have it when you have that experience, you never forget it. Like in eighty one where I had it one walk out five feet in front of me. I'll never forget that. Never. <laughs> hmm. I had one uh, I was hunting one day over when me and my dad lived in Highland County and I was going to score hunt, so I stopped and lit a cigarette and was looking back at the cabin, turned back around and there was a squatch standing five feet in front of me. Wow. So we stood there and he was over nine foot tall. So we, sat, we stood there and did the looking thing. I turned my head and said, this is going to hurt. I turned my head back around. He was walking off. He just stood there and looked <laughs> at me, and I looked at him from his head to his toes. And it's wow. like and it's like looking at a human in his face. It's just a little hairier. Their skin is, <laughs> his skin was dark, but his hair was thin on top of his arm, but it had long on the bottom of his arms. <laughs> and it looked like a brick wall. But I will never, ever forget that. Very cool. Hey, Ken, uh, yeah, before we actually close this, uh, I wanted to ask you a question. Cause I, <laughs> at one point, I used to get you confused with, with one other gentleman. And you know what? You probably have heard this before. I don't know because my honest opinion. Well, well let me ask you ask it like this. Has anyone ever told you there's at times you look like Lyle Blackburn? <laughs> I am Lyle and, Blackburn. What's that? I am Lyle Blackman. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, got you, dude. Uh, yeah. Oh, dude. Yeah, Lyle, you guys are so similar, though. You guys, I mean, guys have similar hats. <laughs> Lyle's my older brother. But see, here's the thing. I was in the Bigfoot scene a little while before he was. So when he oh, came on okay. wearing that hat, everyone was saying, hey, you can't wear that hat. <laughs> Ken, Ken Gerhardt's already got that hat. But I knew yeah. Lyle through other friends because we're both in the music scene, and I knew his band, and um, 
I, I said, man, it's just, you know, they're, they're cool hats. We can both wear them. But, you know, it's yeah. funny because we, we, we get confused for each other all the time. People will ask me about, the, you know, the, the Legend of Boggy Creek book, and they'll ask him about things that I investigate. So that, uh, you know, we do look similar, but, you know, we have a lot of similarities. We've talked about this before. We were both born, uh, our birthdays are days apart in October. He's like one year and five days older than me or something like that. So uh, we both grew up listening to Kiss, which was a pretty popular band back in the late 70s. All right. So, I mean, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> we're both musicians. So, I mean, the list goes on and on, right? But Lyle's an awesome guy, oh, yeah. very, very bright researcher, definitely digs up a lot of good information. I mean, he's not afraid to get out there in the field or... or get out there and beat the bushes for information and stuff. So, But he'll be at the Mothman Festival along with Scott and I uh, this coming weekend as well. He'll be doing a lecture about uh, the Lizard Man. Let's go. Oh, okay. Yeah. Lizard Man. Oh. Uh, hey, <laughs> could I, well, I don't know, could I put you on the spot about one or on the, something else? Just curious because, you know, everyone always sees, like, well, especially Lyle. You know, well, actually, no, I take it back. I think I've seen Lyle Blackburn without his hat on. I don't think I've ever seen you without a hat on. Uh, just out of curiosity, uh, what, what do you look like without your hat on? It, if you don't want to, just say so. It's not, no big problem. <laughs> um, I'm a little thin right here underneath my uh -huh. hat. But I actually, I, I have, uh, I was on a show called Ancient Aliens uh, about two weeks ago, and uh, they wouldn't uh -huh. let me wear the hat for that show. So oh. Basically got I'll a lot have to look people. that up. <laughs> yeah, Ancient Aliens, it was the episode on deep sea creatures. I've and, seen that. Uh, yeah, so I was on that, and I've also been on a couple other TV shows without my hat on. Occasionally, they won't let me wear it for whatever reason. So, oh, okay. But you know, Dan, that uh, you know, Ken's joined that rather elite club of of uh, people in this profession that uh, they have so many brains. There's no room for hair follicles. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Well, maybe I'll I'll have to come across as a poser because I used to shave my head for the longest time. So. <laughs> I've done that before too, you know. Yeah. If if you look through some of my old pictures, I I do shave my head on occasion, so I'm long overdue to do that, so yeah. <laughs> Very cool. All right. Well, uh Fred or Scott, do you guys have anything you want to ask or throw out um uh, to uh Ken before we leave? Um, well, all I can do is tell you that Ken has always been a major asset when he's been on expedition with me. I think we've done it twice now, mm -hmm. and awesome. uh, so we've we haven't actually uh, had any sightings together. We've tried real hard, <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, he, you know, Ken was with me when we found the uh, what we think is swamp ape hair uh, when I was with my uh, uh, the class I was teaching at FKCC. And uh, although nature didn't cooperate with us that that week, that we were looking for the Carabelle cat uh, down in the Panhandle of Florida, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Ken and uh, um, Lee Hales uh, you did some really good work there to uh, try and help uh, put some or shed some light on the the sightings that have been going on there and still are. Okay. Yeah, uh, you brought Thanks, up Scott. The, yeah, you brought up the uh, excuse me. You brought up the ha uh, the hair. I have, have you ever tried to have that uh, tested at all? Uh, yeah, well, at the time that we found that, it was before they could do hair testing for DNA with uh, if you didn't have a follicle. Uh, so the sample, I wound up giving the sample to Discovery Channel for a TV show, uh, knowing that they were going to take it to USC uh, to Mike Hughes, who's a forensic hair specialist out there. And Mike did do the tests that were available at that time. Uh, and hmm. it came back as being not from any known North American animal, but they, that it was definitely larger than a dog. Wow, that's awesome! Though. I tell you, I, I have, you know, Fred's come across hair samples. I've gotten hair samples and collect them very carefully, you know, using the proper technique. Mm -hmm. Now I've sent them off to Jeff Meldrum the way he told me to, because I, you know, I messaged him before I even, you know, sent them off. And, he instructed me exactly how to do it, and mm -hmm. so I did. And mm -hmm. months went by, didn't hear nothing. I, you know, and you know, I know he's a busy man. He's, you know, he's a professor, and he's. I'm sure he's got people sending him everything, you know, left and right from whatever. But uh, you know, I found out what my hair was, 
but it wasn't through him. <laughs> um, the actually the young lady who did the newspaper article and the story on me and the groups, she because uh, I happened to bring him up in you know part of my interview and and so she contacted him and I learned through her through you know you know because she questioned she had you know she brought it up to him and I guess she wanted to know what was going on. So actually, after I read the article that they did on me, uh, yeah, quoted by Jeff Meldrum, they had from the hair fiber, the hair that was found, um, it was actually simply bare hair. So, which was you know a little disappointing, but yet I'm glad I got to find out what it was. <laughs> yeah. so, well, uh, it, and usually yeah, that's what happens. I have people send me samples all the time, and it almost always comes back, uh, you know, bare hair. Yeah. But, right. uh, yeah, but don't, don't don't judge Don too uh, too uh, harshly because I've sent things to Don many times at Idaho, uh, and uh, uh, unfortunately I don't think their mail room is all together because many times things have gotten uh, misplaced. Yeah. Right. Not, but, not, no, I totally understand that. And I, I mean, it was nothing nothing against uh, Dr. Jeff Meldrum at all because yeah, I'm I highly respect him. And, you know, I've read a lot of his work and research, and yeah. and he he's one of the many that I do look into for you know understanding and basic knowledge of a lot of stuff. You know, and, and I, I know he's a very incredible man. I watch him on a lot of a lot or most of his documentaries. You know, and and uh, so yeah, he's yeah he's a great guy. You know, I respect what he does. So hopefully, well, you might, learn more might from find him in the uh, you might find it easier given where you're located to uh, send hair samples to Paul first at Idaho. Um, <clears throat> uh, Ohio State. Yeah. Now, I'm, now one of my okay. samples. Yeah. Now, one of my samples I sent away uh, a few years back. Can't remember who I sent it to, but I, out of four samples I had sent all over the all over the United States and Canada, one come back unknown primate, and the rest of them's been a bear or a coyote or something like that. But the unknown primate, you know, that's all they could say. They couldn't say well, anymore. that's a that's a tough call because if it's unknown, yeah. they wouldn't know what it was to begin with. There's nothing right. to compare it to. Yeah, because they said they uh, if I can remember if I can remember, they said that uh, uh, they they did not match any of the DNA sequence of any um, animals or any creature on the East Coast or the Midwest or something uh, like that. Yeah. Yeah. Things so like yeah, okay, you know, because I found this. Eight and a half to nine foot up on a power line telephone pole, yep. in a power mm. line, and I got video of me busting my caboose trying to get that hair. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you did. Yeah. <laughs> so, but it was basically well, the same. It was basically the same area Daniel found his hair at. You know, was, he was at the beginning. Mine was around the bend, about like five poles down further. You know, but you know, I, I mean. I've seen plenty more hair samples, and I just got to the point I just won't even collect them no more. Because you know? <laughs> mm. they're all you're going to get well, the same answer anyway. I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to interrupt, Fred. Um, yeah, uh, first of all, Ken, I want to welcome, uh, excuse me, thank you very much for participating in you know, the Do This podcast. Um, it was great having you on here, and we've actually had a, uh, a decent amount of viewers actually on here. Cause, you know, I get to see how many. It don't show me who they are; it just tells me a number of viewers. But we had a fairly decent amount, and you know, I know not everyone can get to it, so I'm sure this podcast will be watched later after it gets uploaded to my YouTube channel. Um, so, but again, I want to thank you very much. Uh, you shared some great stuff, and I've actually, I believe, I've learned something today. <laughs> thank you, Daniel. And uh, hope to learn more in the future. Yeah, you're very welcome. And thank you, Freddie. Um, you're uh, awesome as well. And Scott, this is a nice surprise having you kind of jump on as well. So uh, we'll have to do this again real soon. Well, thanks oh, for the absolutely. invite. We'll see you this weekend. Looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah. definitely yeah. looking forward to it, brother. <laughs> yeah, come on down to Virginia, man. All right. Then, all right. Sounds good. All right. Take care. Have a good Take one. Care. Thank you very much. <laughs> you too. All, all right. right. Um, all right, take it easy, Ken. All right, All right. Uh, we live. Uh, I was gonna make a couple of announcements. Uh, well, Fred, hi, while you're on here and we're still live, you want to go ahead and make your announcement for your upcoming podcast that you want to tell viewers? Yeah, on the uh, just coming Sunday at 8 p.m. Um, I'm having a podcast. It's called Food Sources for Sasquatch. 
and it's basically going to be on um, the food sources in the woods, you know, like um, from anywhere from nuts to berries to tree bark to wild game or something like that, you know, and it's going to be on that. And part two is going to be a couple weeks later on the uh, medical uses of plants in, uh, in, our, in our national forest lands or on our, in our woods. So that'll be, like I say, that'll be the, the 20th, which will be this coming Sunday at 8 p.m. Hmm. Awesome. And now we're in September. Next month, October, um, right now, I'm not going to mention no names. Uh, we do have a guest possibly lined up, and uh, he's been all around the world. And I'm not going to mention, like I said, because not till I got a confirmation uh, from him. Uh, I've been in a discussion with him earlier today, and I'm waiting to hear back from him. As soon as he confirms a date for the month of October, I will announce and have actually a um, – podcast link set up and with a big old announcement about that so right now we have a mystery guest for the month of october uh, of course that's subject to change if he's for some reason not able to do it uh, i'm going to start doing podcast shows during a week um if not if it works better on the weekend for a guest uh we'll do that um i try to keep my weekends open uh, especially like you know i'm because that's one right now i'm currently able to get into the woods so but um yeah stay tuned be on the lookout for october's mystery guest and uh let's see fred candy has a youtube channel you should check out his youtube channel if you're not familiar with you uh freddie Can uh candy check out youtube channel freddie 59 100 and also if you're new to watching my podcast or uh, haven't been on to my YouTube channel, check out ECBRO98, which is my YouTube channel. Um, of course, you could always find us on Facebook, and we're always there. And uh, if you ever have any questions, email us, Facebook us, whatever. Um, also, you can follow me on Twitter, ECBRO98, or just enter in my name with ECBRO, and you'll find me. Um, but, Everyone, we had a great amount of viewers tonight, and uh, I want to thank you guys for tuning in. Again, be on the lookout for other random podcasts coming up, and uh, talk to you all later. God bless. Good night.